I'm Elisa Gilbert. I work at the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment at Imperial College London. And it's my job to help take all of the work that the amazing academics here do on climate change related subjects and make sure that it can have an impact on the world through engagement with policymakers, business people and the creation of innovative new climate businesses. OK, I, I'm Jim Ski and I'm Professor of Sustainable Energy here at Imperial College, but I've spent nearly the last eight years acting as co-chair of Working Group 3 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which looks after mitigation or how we can cut emissions. OK, so Jim, your area of expertise is on sustainable energy, and that's obviously an area of scientific endeavour, but also an important area to help us make decisions about what we can do about climate change. So what's your feeling about the ways in which science like that can really make a difference in, in the policy sphere and actually have an impact on global change? Well, I, I think in terms of reducing emissions from sectors like, like energy, I mean, science feeds in, in all, sorts of, all sorts of ways. I mean, basic science has given us the solar cells that, that are now beginning to, you know, substitute for fossil fuels in, in electricity systems. The social scientists and the economists can actually help us work out how regulatory systems and policies can put in place. And other kinds of social scientists can actually help us think about, you know, ordinary people uh, might actually change the, the, the way they live if they want to in order to reduce emissions and reduce their carbon footprints. So, I mean, our, our working group, which covers mitigation, it covers the whole spectrum from hard physical sciences through economics and engineering right through to the social sciences. It's a really broad domain. I mean, it's great. All of those areas, I can see how they are really, really relevant to the questions we have to tackle. And of course, I know that those academics work in a really rigorous way to find out the information that we need and how the solutions will work. What I, I see sometimes is the challenge is getting that rigorous information and then translating that into something that can be used by the policymakers or the decision makers or the practitioners on the ground to make that difference. So what, what are we doing well already or how can we bridge that gap? Well, well ju just to say, uh, you know, in a position like this in IPCC, we have a perpetual, uh, you, you know, sort of endeavour, I won't say a struggle, uh, you know, to try to get people to communicate in ways that people outside the academic sphere can, can actually understand. Uh, and I, th I think we partly succeed in this. I wouldn't say our reports are suitable material for primary schools or even secondary schools, but, you know, we hope that we've pitched them at the, at the level of fairly well educated people you know, who, who, have, who have the need to actually put practical policies you know into the field and actually make things happen so i hope we've succeeded in doing that at least well i mean i've certainly seen some of the diagrams that came out from the most recent reports being used by people who are practitioners or policymakers. so i think there's definitely a huge amount of progress has been made um recently mm. in that issue um just let's step back a moment and and make sure that i've got a clear understanding of how the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, relates to this international process that we know about, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So in the UNFCCC, that framework convention, we have over 190 countries all committed to action on climate change. They come together, they negotiate their high-level strategic targets and all of the different mechanisms they're going to use to reach them. How does that relate to the scientific endeavour in the IPCC? Yeah, and, and just to say, uh, IPCC has a completely separate mandate Perfect. from the Framework Convention on Climate Change. You know, our task is to produce advice on climate change and climate change action in a way that is not full of policy recommendations and prescriptions, but, you know, presents the options for action in a very clear and uh, neutral kind of way. And the same 195 countries turn up for IPCC that turn up for the Framework Convention on Climate Change. But actually, they quite jealously guard IPCC's separate mandate, which is to stick to the scientific advice and not get engaged in the policy recommendations or the, or the, or the decision making. Now, that's quite ironical because you take something like the 1.5 degrees report, which was really influential about five years ago. So the governments all got together as part of the Framework Convention on Climate Change and said, we'd like to invite IPCC to produce a special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees. The same governments then got together as IPCC and debated whether or not to accept that invitation. So it is a little bit of an ironical uh, you know, kind of situation, but they are very separate mandates. But it is worthwhile saying 
that if you look at the activities under the Framework Convention, you know, at the conferences, the parties, at the intersessional meetings, IPCC's fingerprints are all over the kind of evidence that the governments are looking at. So just on that basis, I think we do have an influence, but it's not of the kind of influence of making tendentious policy recommendations. It's standing back a little bit from it. Yeah, so it's a really well-structured example of where the evidence is gathered in a really rigorous way for a clear purpose, yeah, so yeah. for the UNFCCC, but under different auspices, and then it feeds back in effectively. Yeah, if I could just pick up one thing, yeah. it's not just for the UNFCCC. This is really important. It's also for the individual governments, and we would regard it as also being for other stakeholders who are not governments as well. So UNFCC is an important audience, but it's not, but not the, the only, only audience. audience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, I think yeah, that, yeah. And you can see that's quite yeah. powerful. As I said before, I've seen practitioners in all places yeah. pick up on the diagrams or the content yeah. of it. It's, yeah. um, okay, so then looking ahead, because you've been involved in this cycle mm. as a co-chair of Working Group, um, we've pretty much just completed a cycle. So looking ahead, what do you think the challenges are or the things that need to be tackled in the next cycle, not just content, but also how it's done? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, uh, you, you know, in terms, I mean, I can talk about specific scientific issues mm. that, that, that are, just still need to be resolved. But I think one of the questions is going to be the policy relevance, because with COVID, uh, we also had we had delays to the sixth assessment cycle. It was intended to last seven up to seven years. It's nearly eight by the time that it's done. And what that means, it's going to be very difficult for IPCC to produce a lot of outputs in time for the second global stock take under the Paris Agreement in 2028. So one of the big challenges is going between the scientists and the governments to actually think about what kind of suite of reports or other kinds of outputs from IPCC could help to mesh with the Framework Convention on Climate Change cycle. That, 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 that's a big issue. We also have an issue, a continuing issue around representation, uh, kind of issues. Uh, we, we do aim for 50% developed, 50% developing country authors. Uh, and I'm proud to say that we managed a special report on climate change on land in the last cycle, which was the first ever IPCC report to have more developing country authors than developed. And that was, that, that, that was actually a first. Uh, there are also issues, you know, we, we divide authors by six regions, which are used by the World Meteorological Organization. And we're pretty good at getting the balance between these regions after a lot of debate between the Bureau members from the different regions. What is coming up as an issue is representativeness within regions, so intra-regional representation. Because, for example, in Asia, you know, we could fill ourselves with Indian and Chinese authors. They make really valuable contributions. And both these countries are really strong scientifically. But what about the smaller countries you know, within the region? How are their perspectives going to be reflected? And the one last thing I want to flag is gender as an issue. We would aim for 50%. But for, with the nominations from government, we appear to be stuck at a ceiling of about 30% nominations for women. Now, when we select from their nominations, we can bump that up by a few percentage points, but we can't exercise a revolutionary change. So there is an issue in trying to encourage governments to come forward with a more balanced set of recommendations. That's not for the scientists, that's for, that's for the governments to do. So, so maybe thinking about then your 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 running to be the potentially the chair yeah. of the next cycle yeah. how would you see building on that experience you had with the just transition commission yeah. in scotland to apply that perhaps to a cycle a future cycle of the ipcc bearing in mind some of those challenges you described about representation etc yeah. yeah well it's important to remember that the the chair of ipcc isn't the czar you they don't snap their finger and things happen automatically we have to remember the panel is supreme and decisions are made in a very distributed kind of way. So the job of the chair is much more to nudge and persuade, convene, bring people together in order to, to, to get things, both formally within the meetings and informally uh, outside of it. And luckily enough, I mean, I, I have had experience within IPCC of doing what will sound like quite boring administrative things. You know, uh, I was involved in developing the conflict of interest policy for IPCC, uh, which involved engagement with more government lawyers than I have, have ever wanted to. And I've also just finished chairing a group on publications and translations to make sure that when we approve a report, 
it appears in printed form in a timely manner. You might have noticed that it took more than four years uh, to get the 1.5 degrees report from the approval to an actual printed version. And that's the kind of thing we need to avoid. And we need translations into all the official UN languages to appear in, fa in a fairly prompt way as well. So that's what we were working on. So what I've learned from that is, is kind of how to pull the strings in IPCC, whether it's with authors or the Secretariat based in Geneva or with governments. So we've just very recently seen the, the last sort of IPCC report complete. Some really interesting, useful things, new, new diagrams, new perspectives. What are the big questions on the table for the next cycle? Right, right. Okay. okay. And, and just to say, I can't actually tell you what the contents of the reports would be because we okay. haven't scoped them yet. Yeah, okay. so, so okay. That's going to, that, 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 that's really quite important. But I think one of the issues, I mean, thinking about the, the longer term will be the issue. I mean, Working Group One has told us that we will reach global warming of, of 1.5 degrees in the early 2030s. And then we can go through all the semantics about whether we reach 1.5 or past 1.5 or whatever. But one of the questions will be to keep 1.5 alive. That would really mean sticking to 1.5 by the end of this century. And to do this, we may need to bring temperatures down again and take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. You know, what, what scientists have called overshoot of, of a warming limit. And I don't think we understand the implications of overshoot at all. Well, we do to a certain extent, but there's a lot of more work done. In the physical sciences, we need to understand how the carbon cycle is going to react. Uh, in the working group two impacts and vulnerability area, we don't understand about the, the reversibility or the irreversibility of some of the impacts. And there are lots of uncertainties about the technologies or techniques that you would use to take carbon dioxide of the atmosphere, which affects us in working group three. So there's a whole cluster of areas there that are more about the long term and bringing things down. But the strong messages that we've got from governments is that they would more like more attention on implementation and action in the nearer term. You know, what, what, what we can do in the next few years to put ourselves in, in the right track. And I think we started to move that way in working groups three and two. In, in the last cycle. And I think there's going to be, have to be a lot more emphasis on that. But with one qualification, it is much more difficult to approve material mm -hmm. with governments that's about implementation because it takes you very close to the policy domain and it needs a very careful walking of the tightrope between scientific neutrality and policy relevance to keep you on track there. You've been involved in this kind of work for a long time. so taking the science and trying to make a difference with it. What have, what have you seen in terms of mindset change from some of those practitioners or the policymakers in terms of how they use? Yeah, the yeah. I, I mean, just, so this is a policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive response. Okay. But, um, but I think the, you know, the big chain change is, I mean, you know, in the earlier days of IPCC, people debated whether human beings cause climate change at all. That has been put to rest because the word unequivocal was actually used in the last assessment report. So that kind of, that kind of climate scepticism, I think at the government level, you know, has actually, actually gone. And I think, you know, governments have accepted the need for ambitious climate action. That's reflected in, you know, the nationally determined contributions, uh, which have a 2030 timescale and the even more ambitious net zero target set for mid century, uh, so the, the long term is a very safe place to make commitments, if I can put it that way. What I think we still need to see is the, the kind of the implementation and the actions that will bring these ambitions to fruition. Thanks so much, Jim. That was a really, really interesting conversation. Yeah, well, that, that was really great. Thanks for the opportunity.